Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning, Lord. We don't proclaim to be professional Christians, Lord, or learned Christians. We don't proclaim to be experts in anything. We come to you, Lord, as disciples, and we just want to follow you, Lord, and you know our hearts. You know that we love you. Lord, there are so many times, Lord, when we slip, when we allow the devil a footing in our life. But we thank you this morning for the blood of your Son that cleanses us of all unrighteousness. We thank you for our standing with you this morning. And this morning, Lord, edify your body. Lord, as we look upon your scriptures, Lord, show your body who they are in you. And equip us, Lord, for the days ahead, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we're looking at Mark chapter 1 this morning. Mark chapter 1. And I've asked you to try your best. I know it's not easy. It's not easy to try to look at the Gospels with fresh eyes. Because many of you have read the Gospels so many times before. People try to sanitise the Bible. Do you understand what I mean by that? They try to sanitise even the Gospels. There are people that they call themselves red letter Christians. They only believe what's written in red in the Bible. It's only the words of Jesus that they follow it. Nothing else matters. What they don't realise is that even in the red letters, Jesus deals with mess. And in the Gospels, we see Jesus dealing with people's lives that are really messed up. And we see, whether we like it or not, we see that our Lord engages with the demonic from day one. From day one. Now, there's two kind of temptations, if you like. One is to overestimate the demonic realm. The other is to underestimate the demonic realm. They're both actually just as bad as one another. But people today are trying to sanitise the Gospels. So they say that Jesus is the light shining in the darkness. They talk about the darkness as though it's just depression and things that we haven't got right in our lives that could be better. No, the darkness that Christ shines into is a demonic darkness that he came to. And when he shone his light, the demons flee, friends. They went in all sorts of directions. It might not be palpable for us today to, 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 to grasp this, but nevertheless it's true. When Jesus came, there was... Um, and the crazy thing is in the West that we don't mind reading books about the demonic. I'm talking about non-Christians now. They'll read books about it. They'll watch films where clearly there's demonic stuff going in. But when it comes to the actual world that we live in, they, they don't believe there is any. Well, where do you think all those stories come from? Where do you think the inspiration comes from for all those utterly sickening films, particularly in the 80s? They come from the pit, friends. They come from the pit. And so Jesus, when he comes on the scene... <laughs> In a sense, all hell breaks loose, but he deals with it. He always deals with it in the most amazing way. And he, this is so important. He did not come to go demon hunting. He came to set the captives free. That was the reason. And we must always remember that. So this is what it says in Mark chapter 1 verse 20. Then they went into Capernaum. And as we saw on a Sunday night, that the synagogue that Jesus cast this demon out of, you can go and visit to this day the ruins of that synagogue. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and he taught. So he was going in there to do some proactive teaching. You see that? He wasn't going in there with this Ghostbusters uniform on, with these plasma rays, 
he was going in there to proactively teach. That's all. And they were astonished at his teaching. And we looked at it last week. For he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Jesus takes them back to what Torah actually says. That's what he does. He interprets the scriptures correctly for them. They're blown away. They'd never known it in their lifetime. They'd never known anybody teach like this. Now then, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. This, of course, is darkness. This is the darkness. You know, darkness was on the face of the deep. You understand that? And God said, let there be light. And the darkness that was on the face of the deep, right there at the beginning, there are connotations of demonic even in that. You see, Lucifer had fallen. When Adam and Eve are walking through the Garden of Eden, he's already there. He's already fallen and he wants to cause the fall of those that are the apple of God's eye. Darkness was on the face of the deep. Now, there's a lot we don't know. But there's a lot we do know. And this morning we're going to be looking at what we do know, not necessarily what we don't know. And so this unclean spirit is an ancient celestial darkness that's been around for eons of time. And this one had lodged its way into a religious person. So does, does it mean that if you go to church that that makes you a, a child of God? Absolutely not. You can have grown up in church all your life and not be saved. And I'm sure there are people like Nicodemus where Jesus said, "You Nicodemus, I know you're a teacher in Israel. I know everybody respects you. They love you. They look to you. But you must be born again, Nicodemus. And it goes for every person. And here is a person that certainly did not know the Lord and they had a demon. Jesus didn't point them out and embarrass them and shame them and tell everybody how they got this demon. No, he didn't do that. This is what happens. He had an unclean spirit and he cried out saying, this is the spirit, let us alone. What have we to do with you? Now, these words mean something, as we'll see as we get into this. These are not just throwaway words that the demonic are saying. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Why did they say that? There's a reason. Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, I hope you notice, there's two things that you see here. Number one is that the Messiah became a man and lived and grew up in Nazareth. He became a man. The Word became flesh. What Jesus of Nazareth, he became a man. And secondly, the one that became a man is the Holy One of God, the Son of God. Two things. Two things that this demon acknowledges, has to acknowledge, because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And they have to acknowledge it. They don't want to acknowledge it, but they have to acknowledge it. And there are people in the world today, you know them, I know them, family, friends, work, they do not want to acknowledge it. But one day they will have to acknowledge it. Every demon, every celestial being, even under the sea, those that are raised up, everybody will acknowledge at the, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. Do it now, friends. Do it while you have time, while you have breath in your body. Now look at how Jesus deals with this. He's amazing. He's amazing. And there's a lot going on here. <laughs> There's a lot going on. He says, be quiet. Be quiet. Come out. And of course, the demon took hold of the person, shook them, convulsed them. But I mentioned this last week. In the Gospel of Luke, it, it actually includes that the man wasn't hurt. What a gracious God. 
He's come for sinners. Thank God he's come for sinners because I don't know about you, I qualify as one. I'm so glad he's come for sinners. I am so glad he didn't come for the righteous. Now then, what we're going to do this morning, in a way I suppose, is we're going to do a kind of a demonology for dummies. And, uh, you know, a lot of people mock those books, you know, such and such a thing for dummies. And they won't read them because they think they're above them. But if you've ever read that series of books, they're actually far more in depth than you think. You know, I remember I've read a couple. I've read one on quantum physics, actually. And um, because I I, I want to understand it at the basic level. I don't pretend to be some genius, but I want to understand things. And I don't mind being called a dummy if that means that I can actually get to grips with something. And I want to get to grips with why these things are in here. Why did Jesus have to cast them out? Where did they come from? What's it all about? Why are they there? So that's what we're going to do a little bit this morning. So we're going to turn to the book of James first. Um, James, the letter, James 2, James 2, verse 19. Now clearly Jesus dealt with the demonic. You, you can see that, right? But people still struggle with it. Every single New Testament author, apart from the writer of Hebrews, which some say is probably Paul anyway, every single New Testament author acknowledges the demonic. Every single one. That's really important. Jesus dealt with the demonic. The twelve saw the demonic, the 70 saw the demonic, the book of Acts bears witness to the demonic, and of course the book of Revelation bears witness to the demonic. So to sanitise the Bible and take this stuff out, you can't even understand the gospel unless you understand the fall of Satan. Because if Satan didn't fall, who tempted Eve? How did man fall? And so... The darkness that the light shines into is very much a part of the picture. And this is what it says here. James chapter 2 verse 19. This is James. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble. And they tremble. And as we'll see as we go into the Gospels, demons have emotions, friends. They are personalities. They have emotions, they have will, they have intellect, they have plans. And one of the things that demons do is they fear their future punishment. They fear it. They are normally furious spiritual beings that have um, a raging temper, a raging temper, but they also fear what's coming. What we read here is important because we read that the demonic understand the triunity of the Godhead. Okay, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, Ehad, which is plural, it's plural. And they understand that God is one, and they tremble. Do you, do you see what's going on? We know who you are. You're Jesus of Nazareth. You're the word that's become flesh, and we know that you're the Holy One. And they understand it, and they tremble. I'm telling you, folks, there are Christians that don't understand this. They just don't understand it, and that's why there's no trembling. <laughs> because God is holy, and they see it. I was once 
doing a, uh, a, a uh, the last time I did the book of Revelation was 15 years ago in Congleton in the town hall in Congleton and we rented out this room at big plate glass windows and all the drunks were going past all the time in the pubs and they could see this screen, great big screen with all the scriptures on and whatnot and they'd go past, sometimes they'd bang on the window and all kinds of stuff and we were going through Revelation and, and one day we hadn't even started the, the thing. Um, we'd all, we were all just standing together saying hello, greeting one another, all that. And this girl walked in and... I think some of you will probably remember this, but all I can tell you is she looked like an evil goblin. Um, when people are under the influence of the demonic, their faces change completely. Their eyes bloat out, and, and this it was a shocking look. And she came in, this is before we'd started, and she screamed at me, you have stolen my keys. And there was, a, there was a standoff. And there was an absolute silence in that place. And I was thinking, what do I do, Lord? <laughs> what do I do? And the evil, the intensity, these kind of goblin eyes facing me off. I thought, Lord, I, do, I, do I say, come out in the name of Jesus? Lord, please help me. Help me. And I, it felt to me like an, an age had gone by, and just this absolute silence. And I looked at her, and I thought, and I said to her, I know you. And she went, I said, I went to school with you. You were a year younger than me at school. And she just could, couldn't deal with him. At school, and... The, 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 the men will understand this, right? At school, she was the most naturally pretty girl you've ever seen. She wasn't a flirt. She didn't really wear makeup. She was just naturally beautiful, very quiet, unassuming person, not really a, a particularly popular, you know, just really pretty girl. And I thought, oh my goodness, I cannot believe it's the same girl. And it completely disarmed her. And eventually she walked out. Well, I knew a mum. Because a mum was a home economics teacher at the school. And funnily enough, a mum had just go, started going to church. And I th even then I thought, why is she going to church? She doesn't seem the, the type. So I got hold of her and said, what's going on with your daughter? She came into the Bible study last night and I've never seen anything like it. She screamed at me demonically and she's, we went on a walk actually and um, she said, I said, when did it start? She said it started at university. I said, what happened? She said she got into something called the occult. She didn't even know what the occult was. And um, I managed to uh, share the gospel with that lady and uh, really explain to her that she can be absolutely set free. And you know, she was as much frightened of the gospel as she was of the devil. And she was frightened of the devil. I'm telling you this because there's this thing in church that if you see all these uh, kind of manifest it. Well, there you go. Hallelujah. They've been set free. Now let's move on to the next one. But very often the is only a manifestation. It doesn't mean they've been delivered. Jesus came to deliver people, not to flare them up. He came to set them free through the gospel, not just to have a manifestation for the sake of it. They have to hear the gospel. And the strange thing about that story I'm telling you about is it was, it was more for her mother than it was for her. It was a mum that really responded to the gospel, not her. Incredible. But there are many people, I believe, that are oppressed and not necessarily possessed. And what happens is the demon seizes them for a time and the demon's in control of them, but not all the time. The, it can come and go. It can come and go. 
People think it's oppression, uh, sorry, possession, when a lot of the time it's oppression. But the demon knows who Jesus is and they tremble. They tremble. Now let's just have a look at some scriptures on this because I want you to see this for yourself this morning. Have a look at Mark chapter 6 verse 7. And he called the twelve to himself. Even Jesus, when he was upon this earth, was already preparing for the body to take over. Already preparing for the body to take over. And he began to send them out two by two. And he gave them power over unclean spirits. So Jesus was planning ahead. And... People that say, well, unclean spirits disappeared when Jesus disappeared, that's not actually true. It's not actually true. So he's planning ahead, he's planning down the line. Luke chapter 10, verse 17, he sends out the 70, not the 12 now, the 70. It's a bigger circle, smaller, bigger, bigger, bigger. So he sends, then the 70 returned with joy. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. I know many of you have shared, I've heard your testimonies about demonic attacks that you've had at night, where you have called out the name of Jesus and it goes. So many people talk about their mouth being wired. It's as though you can't speak. The fear comes so strong. You, can't, you almost can't say the name of Jesus. But there's, th this isn't just Christian cliche, stereotypical cliche stuff. There is power in the name of Jesus. And, it, and so they said, Lord, even the demons are subject. But look what Jesus said here. He, and, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. You see that? And he tells them, don't rejoice in the fact that this, this can happen. But rejoice in the fact that you're saved. That's what we're to rejoice in. Jesus never encourages ghostbusters and demon hunters. He doesn't. He says, as you go out and you preach, these things will come and challenge you and you'll deal with them along the way. Okay, let's have a look at Revelation chapter 12. Keep that in mind. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I saw it. Now in Revelation chapter 4, we get some more detail on this. Revelation 12, sorry, verse 4. He, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. Now the stars of heaven in the Gospels, sorry, in the book of Revelation speak of the angels. And he drew a third of the angels with him. They went with him and they were thrown to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Of course, this is speaking of our Lord. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where a place was prepared by God that they should feed her there for basically three and a half years. And verse 7 says, War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels. Notice his angels. The dragon has his own angels now because they've gone with him. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. And you know the situation. Now understand that their names change. So one of the names of Satan was Lucifer. Another one was the holy cherub that covers. These are titles. But they're changed. What they changed to. So his name, when he was... Get this. 
I know it's hard to, to understand, but Satan, when he was Lucifer, before he fell, when he was perfect in his ways, he worshipped God at the throne of God. Along with all those angels that he drew away, they worshipped God. All of them worshipped him. Imagine the ovation of praise and worship that came from them. They worshipped him. Do you understand why when he comes into contact with them, when they are, when they've fallen, he simply says, be quiet. I don't want to speak with you. Be quiet. Some of you have experienced a church split. You've seen what happens when church is split and the, the, the hurt that happens, it's, it's awful. Can you imagine what heaven was like? Can you imagine when Lucifer betrayed God, got puffed up and wanted to be worshipped himself and drew a third of the angels with him that worshipped God, served God, did his bidding, loved him. So when he comes into contact with them, he says, be quiet. I don't want to hear it. Be quiet and come out. Now there's three categories of demons in the Bible. There are those that are loose on the earth and are roaming around. Jesus talks about them. They, they, have you noticed that demons need a body? They desperately seek to be in a body. Then there are those that are temporarily confined. We see them in Revelation chapter 9. They're confined for a time and they're let loose on the earth during the tribulation period. Then there are also those that are permanently confined. They are the disobedient angels from Genesis chapter 6. You can read about it in 2 Peter and Jude. They are permanently confined in the lowest place of hell called Tartarus. And Tartarus is supposed to be as far away from hell as heaven is from hell. In other words, they are confined in the lowest of the lowest pits because of what they did. Because of what they did. So these are the three categories that we see. Now let's have a look at Hebrews chapter 12 just for a minute to just grasp some context here. Okay. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. So how many angels were there? An innumerable amount. Cannot be numbered. That's how many there are. So we have no idea what a third of infinity is. <laughs> we have no idea what a third of innumerable is, but a third of whatever that figure is willingly fell. Willingly fell. Why did they willingly fall? Because God gave them free will. And God has given you and me free will. When we make choices every day, there's, the Spirit doesn't grab hold of you like a robot and stop you from doing it, does he? We have free will. Now this might sound really obvious to everybody, but God did not create demons. Do you understand? God did not create demons. So where did they come from if he didn't create them? Well, the Bible tells us enough. It doesn't go into it in too much detail. You know, if you, if you get an obsession with the abyss, the abyss tends to get an obsession with you. But there's enough in the word for us to know that these disobedient angels actually became the demonic realm. There's more to it than this, but this is the basics. He did not create demons. They are just as 
Lucifer, the light bearer, the anointed cherub that covers, becomes the devil. So the, these wonderful angels that worship God become demonic. And there are categories of them. We see that in Ephesians chapter 6. Let's have a look at 1 John for a minute. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John 4 verse 2. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Why? Because there's one third of an innumerable bunch that have fallen away that are now working against God and the people of God. That's a lot. But test the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit. Now notice what it says here. It's very interesting. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is of God. Because the last thing that they want to confess is that the Word became flesh. Does everybody understand this? What we take for granted that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he came to earth from heaven. He came to this sin-sick place on our behalf. A body was given to him on our behalf so that he would die for our sins, take our sins. What we take for granted, the demonic realm hates with a passion. That Christ became flesh. To us it's like, yeah, of course he did. To them, just the thought of it is terrifying. Because this is the redemptive plan. And they know it. And they have tried to thwart this plan in the scriptures time and time and time again. And they failed time and time again. Christ, the Messiah, became flesh. What did they say? What did this demon say? In the presence of the King of Kings. I know who you are. You are Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One. You are God, come flesh, you're Emmanuel. You're the Holy One. I know who you are. They don't like it. Gnosticism is alive and well, folks. It's alive and well. Not so much maybe in villages and small towns, but you go to cities and you'll find that Gnosticism is rife. Rife. The first year that we were, we were on the farm, we had a bunch of young people that came up from London. They were all Gnostics. They were all sexually fluid. Uh, the, you name it, they were into it. And they wanted to know about Jesus Christ. We'd get knocks on the door on the camper van door, come down. We want. This guy said to me once, can you please come down to the fire pit? I want to talk to you about Gnosticism. I mean, that doesn't happen every day, does it? <laughs> and so I, I did, of course I did. And he's saying to me, I'm fascinated with Gnosticism. I said, all right, yeah, well, why? Well, he says, it, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? And of course, the Gnostics don't believe that Jesus became flesh. And I'm trying to, t after about half an hour of him talking, I'm thinking I need to step in here at some point. I try to tell him that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And he says, you're absolutely right. I thought, oh, we're making progress here. He says, you're absolutely right. We are all the way to heaven. Well, I've just told you that there's only one way to heaven. It's through Jesus. And even Mikey and Natasha understood what I was saying. And this guy looked at me with these eyes and said, you are absolutely right, we are all the way to heaven. Then his hippie girlfriend, well actually it wasn't his girlfriend, um, you know, kind of would-be rock star that didn't quite make it, uh, actually a very good songwriter but not quite good enough, you know what I mean. She, uh, she started to write this song that she'd written about herself, you know, all the failures and weaknesses in life and some nice little chord changes going on, very subtle and nice voice and we're around the fire, the fire's crackling and she gets to the chorus and everybody's sitting there in that kind of hippie, you know, thing that you do. Mm. And she gets to the chorus and the chorus is, but I'm beautiful, I'm good, I'm fine, 
I'm lovely. And, and, and they're all sitting around the fire going, she is. She is, she is, she's lovely, she's lovely. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this, what is this, Lord? This is insane. So then Mikey asked me to bless the food because we're going to eat the food. So I blessed the food in the name of Jesus. And, and before I could finish, she shot up and blessed it in the name of her mother goddess. This is Gnosticism, folks. It hasn't gone away. It's around today and it's utterly demonic. It denies that Christ came in the flesh. It denies the lordship of the Lord. Everything that's written in the scripture is true. A spirit will deny it. Not in the presence of Christ. They have to accept it. But they weave these lies, this doctrine of demons that... Even within the church, they fabricate the church and they change stuff. They're busy. They're active. They're active. So they have an intellect. They are highly intelligent. Did you know that? The demonic are highly intelligent. They know secret information. Have you ever known that? I could tell you stories, I've got stories I could tell you about how they know things about you they have no right to know. They have knowledge of God's prophetic plan. They have knowledge of that. Are you going to send us to the abyss before our time? They understand. How do they understand his plan? Because they worship round the throne. Angels long to look into these things. They have knowledge of Jesus. They know who he is. They have knowledge of his followers. They said um, to the sons of Sceva, uh, Jesus we know, Paul we know. Well, who are you? We don't need to listen to you. And they have knowledge of the abyss and of the throne. They have knowledge. They have emotions. They are fierce. They have anger. They have fear and they mock. Have you ever, have you ever come across a mocking demon? Oh, they, they love to mock and cackle. Cackle. And they have a will. They're not idle. They're active. They're very active. They control people. They control towns. They control cities, nations and even the world. Tells us in the word of God that he has sway over the entire planet with his realm. They spread false doctrine and they like to inflict physical hurt and psychological pain upon people. That's what they do. That's what happens. And what we have done, because in the West of course we're very secular. And we believe in the sciences. That the world is millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years old. That the universe began with a bang. And all this life came from absolutely nothing. And we blindly accept it all. Because we believe in science. And yet the same people that believe in science will watch the most terrifically horrific horror movies and not even think about where, how do you even think things like that up? Where's it come from? It's demonic, folks. And I'll tell you in a little bit, the police know about demon possession and so do hospitals. Both the police and hospitals deal with demon possession. I once went to visit somebody uh, that was, was demon oppressed uh, in, in a mental home and I walked in and as soon as I walked in this woman come walking to me shouting out I am the Antichrist I thought that's an interesting uh, welcome to that place but that's it folks these, these things are real but we've sanitised it we've sanitised I'm not saying to you go out looking for demons but don't do the opposite either Don't think that they're not there. They are there and this is why the world is heading where it's heading. Why do you think that most politicians are liars? Why do they lie so much? Do you know that demons are liars? Do you know that Satan was a liar from the very beginning? That his natural tongue is to lie? These things come from somewhere and the whole world is under the sway of him. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 3. Therefore, therefore, I make it known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit, that is the Spirit within them, 
will say that Jesus Christ is accursed. No one, no spirit, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. See, so a demon, a demon will say all sorts of things. All sorts of things. A demon, a lying demon, will never say that Jesus Christ is Lord. You see? It's the last thing they want to do. It's the last thing they want to admit to. Can you see? We're told in the scriptures that they will never admit that Christ came in the flesh. And they will never admit his lordship. What did the demon do in the synagogue? The demon in the synagogue had no choice in the presence of the Son of God to say, you are Christ in the flesh. And you, 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 you've lived a normal life in Nazareth, and yet you're the Holy One of God. And that concoction is, to them, speaks of the end of everything for them. Because it succeeded. A friend of mine who is, has one of the best minds for the Word of God I've ever known. He really has a mind for the Scriptures. Um, very interesting guy to talk to. He, he really has a problem with deliverance ministries. Because there's a lot of deliverance ministries have other influences in their doctrine. It would take another session to explain what those influences are. But he and his girlfriend, middle class people, worked on a farm down south and they made the best cannabis that money could buy. And they had fields of the stuff, for a farm. I had a lot of it and they were making an awful lot of money. One day, in the middle of all this, and he believed, he believed at the time that cannabis was a way of freeing your mind to, to, to kind of stick it to the man, you know? And um, him and his wife got very attracted, his girlfriend at the time got very attracted to God. And they made a commitment to the Lord. Um, all because it said in the word of God, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That was enough for him. Just to re hear those words, he's a very intellectual guy, but it was enough for him to think, there's something in this. But they decided, before they fully committed, that they would have a last hurrah on cannabis. And so they had this last hurrah on cannabis. And I would rather him testify to you what happened because it'd be much better and I hope one day that he does because it's an incredible testimony. When people are demon hunters and they're just crazy for demons, I don't really take that much notice. I, I probably all the same. But when I know people that are the complete opposite, that have seen New Testament demon possession, I listen. And what happened on that trip, his girlfriend started to to say, repeat and repeat and repeat that she wanted to know the devil. She wanted to know the devil or get to know him. And that night she ended up, uh, and it's best if you actually hear it from them, but for the next six or seven days they could not hold her down. They had four or five men trying to hold her down. She had the strength of many people. She ended up in hospital. They told her in hospital, they told the nurses in hospital, don't leave on her own and don't have one person looking after her. I promise you, you, you will not be able to control her. She was throwing men around. It took, I don't know how many men to hold her down, but they gave her enough um, drug, I don't know what kind of drug, sedative, for five men. And that night, she was raped in hospital. Raped in hospital. And when you hear this whole account, and you realise that the things that you read about in the New Testament are still actually happening today. By the way, they're gloriously set free. 
by the blood of the Lamb. And they are serving the Lord now uh, in the most marvellous ways and they are committed to the word of God. But they're committed to dealing with the demonic the way that the word says to deal with the demonic. Okay? Because I think when you've seen the real thing, the real thing, it's absolutely shocking. It's shocking what they can do and say. Okay. Now then, we need to look at this before we go any further. Now you know the scripture, like the back of your hand, but turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. Genesis 3, verse 14. The very first prophecy in the entire Bible was given by God to the devil. The devil was given the first prophecy. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this. You have done this. Do you understand? This is the darkness that Jesus shone a light into. Because you have done this. There are people, friends, even Christians that are attacked and oppressed. And we need to be set free. We need to come together. And we'll, at the end of this, we'll look at this. How do we deal with this today? Not back then, but today. How do we deal with it as a church? When people get attacked, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hatred or enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first prophecy about the virgin birth in the Bible and that the virgin birth would actually crush the devil's seed. It's here in scripture. And so the demonic realm has always hated the doctrine that Christ would become flesh. Does everybody understand that? Because that's the prophecy from the very beginning. That Christ, the seed, the seed in Galatians, Christ is called the seed. The seed became flesh and smashed the enemy, crushed the enemy. So this is what we see here. So all the way through the scriptures, we see the demonic realm trying to stop the birth of Christ. The virgin birth of Christ. Have a very quick look at Genesis chapter 6 verse 4. We're not going to spend much time on this. This is really just a brief overview. But in Genesis 6 verse 4, there was violence on the face of the earth. When you look at what was going on, it was absolutely demonic. And we read about a time when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Daughters were born to them and the sons of God, which is a term for angels in the Old Testament. So the daughters of men and they were beautiful. They took wives for themselves, all of who they chose. And the Lord said, when this particular thing happened, and the offspring of this were these mighty men with incredible strength. The Lord said, my spirit will not strive with men forever. For he is indeed flesh and it's been given, he's been given 120 days. There were, and your Bible will say giants. The word is Nephilim. And the word Nephilim in Hebrew means fallen ones. Fallen ones. There were fallen ones in those days. The reason why God flooded the world is because the union between the fallen angels and the women were Nephilim fallen ones. In other words, they were trying to destroy the line and stop Messiah from being born. We've just read about it in Revelation chapter 12. With the dragon trying to stop the Messiah from being born. It's always been this way in the scripture. Stop him before he's born. Pollute the line. We see it so many times in the Old Testament. And so God sent a flood. And the fallen ones, celestial, terrestrial mix, were drowned out. But their spirits were not. Their spirits were not. So these are spirits that had bodies which no longer have bodies and spend the rest of their time roaming around the planet trying to occupy a body. So to recap, in the Bible it teaches that there are demons that are loose on the planet 
trying to get into a body. There are those that are temporarily confined and let loose in Revelation chapter 9. And there are those that are permanently confined. The disobedient angels from the time of Genesis, 2 Peter Jude tells you they are permanently confined in the lowest hell for the great white throne judgment. They will never be let out because of what they did. They left their abode. They went after strange flesh. See? Have a look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. This is to an evil king that was disobedient to God. And Isaiah said to him, ask for a sign. Ask for a sign. He says, I won't tempt the Lord with a sign. I'm far too spiritual to do that. He says, you can ask for any sign you want, from the highest to the depth. And he says, no, 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 I won't ask for a sign. So it says in Isaiah 7, 14, this is to Ahaz, who is of the tribe of Judah. He's of the line of the Messiah. He says to the line of the Messiah, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call him Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. God is manifest in the flesh. That's how it's put to Timothy. God is manifest in the flesh. I know who you are, they say. You're Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One. And they hate it because... The incarnation, God in flesh, is the ruination of every demon. And it's the jubilee for every born again Christian. So then go two chapters further on. Just two chapters further on. Two chapters further on, chapter 9, it says, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. And it tells you the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, this is where Capernaum was, what we're looking at, this completely normal, sleepy town of fishermen and traders and tax people just going about their normal life, a great light shone. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And where does this light go? To Galilee of the Gentiles and Jesus picks the most normal of places to display his absolute glory and blinding splendor and when he walks into that synagogue on that day somebody that has had a demon dormant in them for we, we don't know how long blurts out exactly who he is and to this day many of the Jewish people are blind to who he is. The very thing that the demon says in this Jewish man, they are blind to. That Christ has come in the flesh and he is the Holy One of Israel. But the demons know and they tremble. They tremble. Do you not feel blessed this morning that God, by his absolute grace and mercy, has for whatever reason is beyond understanding, he has shown you who he is. Let's just fast forward on a bit. Daniel chapter 10, verse 20. Daniel 10, verse 20. I'll read it out to you because of time. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? I, and now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. What's this talking about? It's talking about territorial spirits. Spirits that, demonic spirits that have control of entire nations. In this instance, it's Greece and it's Iran. Iran. And they have control over them. We know further on in the Bible that there are spirits over Russia. Russia. And look at what Russia's doing now. Persecuting and putting to death as pastors as we speak. Trying to um, persecute anybody that they can. The dis total disregard for human life. And of course, we can see anti-Semitism beginning to rear its ugly head in Russia as we speak. Gog and Magog. Ezekiel tells us about this. There's spirits over Russia. 
Every nation has an angelic, demonic realm that have plans, personality. They're there. You hear people say, I don't trust any politician. They're all liars. Well, he has sway over the entire world. And guess what his favourite hobby is? Lying. That's his favourite hobby. Jesus says it's his native tongue to lie. 1 John 5, 1 John 5, <coughs> verse 19. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. What the Bible teaches. The entire planet lies under the sway of the wicked one. So, here we are, I've got about... Five minutes-ish to explain. What does the church do? Now, what am I talking about here particularly? I'm talking specifically about people in church that end up being attacked demonically or oppressed demonically. What do they do? So we know from the point of view of an unbeliever, in scripture, an unbeliever has the demon cast out in the name of Jesus. But what do believers do that have been bought by the precious blood of the Lamb and have the seal of the Holy Spirit in their lives? Those that have been bought by the precious blood of the Lamb and have the seal of the Spirit in their lives, no spirit can cast out that spirit. No demonic spirit can go where the Spirit of God is. That cannot happen. So when a Christian is oppressed or attacked, what do they do? In the New Testament, what does the New Testament say to do? That's what we're going to look at in about five minutes. Turn to the book of James a second. The book of James chapter 4 verse 7. This is what to do. A few years ago, um, a chappy came to me, wanted me to go around and see him once a week. I did for, actually for quite a few weeks. He split up with his wife and he was absolutely convinced that he'd got demons. Convinced. He says, I need these demons casting out of me. I said, I don't believe you've got demons. He says, I'm telling you, I've got demons and I need them casting out. After weeks of listening to him, and it's like a broken record, you know what I'm on about? It's the same story every single week. After weeks of listening to him, I took him to Galatians and showed him the works of the flesh. I said, everything that you're struggling with is the works of the flesh. It's not demonic. Okay, he, he, didn't, he, he rejected that, by the way, but it was the works of the flesh. This is what the Bible says to do if you are a blood bought Spirit sealed Christian, child of God, this is what you're to do. James chapter 4, verse 6. He, but he gives more grace, therefore he says, and this is key. This is key. If you are a child of God and you want to be free from a demonic attack and you can be attacked, there's no two ways about it. Be humble. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Be humble. Because if you look at the original sin that caused Lucifer to fall, it was pride. Be humble. And then he says this, Therefore, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is the way a Christian gets free from, a, from demonic torment or demonic oppression. We submit ourselves to God. And we resist the devil. And he will flee. And it, here's the thing, friends. It takes time. Nowhere in the New Testament do you see Christians casting demons out of other Christians. You don't see that. We're told to submit ourselves to God, to resist the devil, and he will flee. And by the way, it takes time. We have to get victory over these things. Whatever footholds the devil has got in us that we've given over to him, and it happens, doesn't it? It takes time. And you have to submit yourself to God afresh. And the key to that is to be humble. 
Because God resists the proud. There's no point in doing it if you're proud. Be humble. Tell him the predicament that you're in and submit yourself to him and resist the devil. And he will flee. Have a look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. We read it earlier on. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and so on. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But we're wrestling against a very highly organized ancient celestial system that knows every single trick in the book. Every political move that there is. They've replayed it over through the generations time after time after time. They're very, very, very wise. That's why it says in Jude, you don't go uh, uh, trying to rebuke these things. You don't go out of your way demon hunting. You do not do that. But our wrestle is not against them. Our wrestle is not against, sorry, the flesh. It's against them. Now, why does Paul say that? Because he knows that their realm actually infiltrates into us and Paul is saying, you've got to discern that although they're being influenced by the demonic, our wrestle is with the demonic, not with them. Why? Because Jesus came in Luke chapter 4 to set the oppressed free. But we get it confused in our heads. We get the whole thing confused and we start to attack the person rather than what's actually influencing them. We've all been there, haven't we? We've all been there. But he says, you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. This is principalities and powers. Now look at this. The list is very interesting. Therefore, take apart. This is how we resist the devil. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Those of you that have been saved more than five years will know there are days in your Christian life, or rather seasons, that are downright evil. You know something's coming after you. You know it's trying to take you down. And there are many, many ways that it does. Well, how? How do we resist the devil? How do we withstand in the day of evil? Having done all to carry on standing. Therefore, and look at this list. Church, look at this list. People think that the only thing in this list that's the Bible is the sword. That's what they think. Oh, it's the sword of the Spirit. That's it. No, no, no. The entire list is the Word. The entire list of how we stand is our standing in Christ. Everything about this list is showing us our standing in Christ. And that's how we stand against the evil one. By understanding our standing in Jesus. That's how we stand. You see, you look at the, the shoes of the preparation of the gospel. You know they had spikes through them. You already know that. But how do you advance? You advance with the gospel. It's only the gospel that can cause a person to advance. You advance in the gospel, but you also stand your ground in the gospel. Because the gospel's immovable. It's wonderful. We're saved by grace through faith. Nobody can boast. It's not our work. And we stand. So when the enemy comes and he says, you've done this, this and this, you say, I'm standing in the blood of the Lamb. Christ came for sinners of which I was a sinner. And I'm standing in the gospel. And I'm not moving. You see? And you move forwards in the gospel. You get your foot down and you move forwards with your shield in the gospel. Look at the list. It's all about the word. First of all, the belt of truth. Folks, this holds everything together. Demons have spokespersons. Even within the church, they have people that will speak lies. The first part of this, how do you stand your ground against a demonic attack? It has to be the truth. It can't be this fabricated nonsense that God wants you rich, therefore... It has to be the truth. Stand in the truth. Secondly, the breastplate of righteousness. Not your righteousness. The imputed righteousness through the cross. I have Christ's righteousness over me. So therefore you can't come near me. Because the righteousness that I have is not my own. 
You see, it's all the word. It's not just the sword of the spirit. It's all the word. And these are the basics. These are the basics that every Christian should know. The breastplate of righteousness. Your feet shod in the preparation of the gospel. It's peace for those that grasp Christ. Peace in the life. The first thing that I ever experienced as a Christian. The very first thing I experienced as a Christian. My life was in turmoil. All sorts of thoughts and stuff going on. The very first thing that I experienced when I accepted Christ. And, 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 and I realised I've got eternal life. Is this peace. This peace. But for the enemy, it's war. There's no love mentioned in any of this. You won't find the word love in this. Because this is warfare. But for the one that has the armour on, there's peace. There's peace in the gospel. When you receive the gospel, you'll get peace. When your family and friends receive Christ, they'll get a peace they never even knew existed in this life. And one of the reasons why you know the person who's been truly saved is because that peace comes. The gospel of peace. Above all, take up the shield of faith. So in front of the imputed righteousness of Christ, there's the shield. It's coming at you like crazy sometimes. It's crazy. And it's coming at you, but you're there, you're standing, you've got your shield head to toe, you're locking in with the other Christians. It's not coming near you. Not coming near you because you're standing your ground together. And what is that shield? It's your faith in Yeshua. Christ became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory. And that glory is now in us. (sighs) The shield of faith which will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. And the helmet of salvation. Who has mind games? Anybody struggle with mind games? Anybody struggle with your mind? Battles going on in your mind? We have this helmet over and it's called salvation. He saved us and no one can take that away. Jesus said, nobody will snatch them from my hand. And so when you face that day, you tell, I am saved. I have the imputed righteousness of Christ. My faith, my shield is in Jesus Christ. I've got the sword of the Spirit and I can speak out the word that God has given to me in that day and the devil will depart for another time. (laughs) This is how, this is it. Because to say that Christians don't get demonically attacked, well, if you haven't had a demonic attack, you're doing something wrong, folks. Very quickly, I said I got about five minutes. Watch out for the doctrine of demons. The doctrine of demons. Demons create doctrine. Teaching in the in the church. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The Spirit expressively says that in the latter days some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrine of demons. And part of that is forbidding marriage. Now we know that the Roman Catholic Church did this for a long time, didn't they? The doctrine of demons promotes immorality. But there's something else going on today. Rather than them forbidding marriage, they've inverted it. And the inversion is working just as well. Instead of forbidding marriage, they're promoting anything but marriage. Anything but marriage. There's a secular band, actually they made Christianity for today and they're not even Christians. There's a secular band that's been around for about 20 years. People love them because they're a family. A husband and wife, even his brothers in this band. Phenomenal band, brilliant musicians. People in the world love them because they see value in them. They stand together, husband and wife, they sing different songs, they're known throughout the world. People see value in them. They see value in the fact that there's marriage. It's really weird because it get, it's counterculture, but somehow it works and people love them for it. It came out two or three days ago that that guy that everybody has looked to and thought, hey, he loves his wife, even though, you know, maybe he could have the most beautiful girl in the world. He's had a whole series of um, relationships with gender fluid people and all sorts that are now suing him because they didn't consent. And 
people have boycotted their gigs. I'm talking about unsaved people here. They boycotted their gigs because they saw something in this band. They saw a marriage. They saw a family. They saw something that means something. But we're living in a society today where we say, well, it's not hurting anybody. Are you? Have you heard that? Well, it, it's, not, it's hurting millions upon millions of people. It's crippling families. Teachers will tell you. Teachers know when a child comes in that's come in from a divorced family, they know. It's hurting people all the time. And what's happening today is we're promoting everything but marriage. Demons and the devil. Did you ever smoke? Anybody ever smoked in the time? I smoked. I can remember saying to my mates in the pubs, lads, I'm giving up smoking. I've never been offered so many fags that night in all my life. <laughs> they want you to be where they are. That's what they want. That's what they want. And they will promise somebody every kind of sexual fantasy going. But it leads to a terrible, terrible, terrible place. A, and a place of terrible shame. There's a doctrine of demons, friends, and it's been promoted in the church. Anyway, in five minutes, we're going to go back to the beginning. We're going on a circle. So go back to Luke chapter 4. This is how you resist the devil. How do you resist an attack? The same way your master did. The same way your Lord did. No different. That's the way you resist the devil. The same way Jesus did. Luke chapter 4, very quickly. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when, they ended, when it ended, he was hungry, and the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Three times, the devil tempted Jesus, tried to shortcut his ministry. That's what Satan wants to do for you. He doesn't want to promote you, he wants to shortcut you. He wants to make sure that your ministry, whatever God has for you in this life, is completely ineffective. So he will offer you a route that's a lot easier. It's a guarantee. It will be a lot easier, but you will not accomplish what God had for you to do. Three times Jesus replied, it is written. This is the sword of the Spirit. This is Jesus taking his stand it is written. And after the third time, the devil left him for a more opportune time. The same way that Jesus resisted the devil is the same way that his body resists the devil. We don't need to go around casting demons out of one another. We need People think they can come to the front, have this weird experience, and then just carry on as normal. And the same person comes to the front again, and again, and again. And it becomes like a broken record. You know why? Because they never resisted the devil, and they never submitted themselves to God. They just wanted a quick fix, and it doesn't work. Jesus now comes to his hometown. Having resisted the devil, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And for those of you that know, and you've been through a barrage, you've been attacked by the enemy, and you come through the other side, you know how you feel. You come out of that valley thinking, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And, the, and I'd want to commit the rest of my life to the promotion of the gospel of peace. In Jesus' name. Is that you this morning? Is that you this morning? I promise you. There's not a valley or a shadow or a sense or a touch. I've seen Christians, supposedly Christians, manifest things. I've seen their eyes roll over completely white 
like you see in the horror films, reading the scripture with their eyes in the head. I've seen that happen. I've seen all sorts of crazy things happen. Resist the devil. Submit yourself to the Lord. Realise what we're standing against here. And most importantly of all, we've got to get about the business. Because if we get about the business, God knows. That one is worthy of the ground that he's planted in.